Welcome, everybody, and good evening. Uh, welcome to the No Pride in Policing Coalition, Creating and Building Abolitionist Futures, our third in the series of teachings. I am Beverly Bain of the No Pride in Policing Coalition and your moderator for this evening. I promise you all a very engaging and inspiring conversation with our amazing panelists. Before we get started, I would like to inform you all that Brian DeMatos, a queer activist who organized in the queer and trans communities, passed away last week. Brian worked with the No Pride in Policing Coalition in its earlier years. Brian's passing leaves many of us quite saddened, particularly during this month of pride. All of us in NPPC extends our condolences to Brian's family, friends, and allies grieving his loss. Now for the land acknowledgement. As we gather today, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 13 territory, a treaty that was established between the Mississauga of the Credit River and the British Crown. We are surrounded by Treaty 13A, Treaty 20, also known as the Williams Treaty and Treaty 19. Today, I speak to you from the city called Toronto, which is, in, which is in the Dish With One Spoon territory, which is treaty between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabek, including allied nations to peaceably share and protect the resources around the Great Lakes. While those of us who are not indigenous have arrived as settlers on indigenous territory in different ways, and we acknowledge that some of our ancestors and elders were forcibly displaced people brought here involuntarily or by force, particularly those brought here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. We acknowledge that we are all treaty people and that we have responsibilities while working and living on the land. And now I will introduce our esteemed panelists and they will speak in the order of introduction. After the presentations, I will put forward a couple of questions to the panelists for discussion. Brianna Olson Pitawanaquat is an Anishinaabekwe, Indigique, and member of Willem Kuhn Unceded First Nation. As a bird worker, jingle dancer, artisan, and radical educator, she is committed to principles of Indigenous liberation and an anti-racist, anti-carceral future in her community. She currently co-leads Toronto Indigenous Harm Reduction and Native Arts Society, both trans and two-spirit-led initiatives. Jamie Magnuson is a queer anti-capitalist activist and scholar in the Adult Education and Community Development Program at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. They teach and write on strategies about taking care, about taking back cities from militarized policing that enforces global racial capitalism. Jamie is a member of the No Pride in Policing Coalition. Robin Maynard is an author and scholar based in Toronto, where she holds the position of Assistant Professor of Black Feminisms in Canada at the University of Toronto Scarborough Campus in the Department of Historical and Cultural Studies. She is the author of Policing Black Lives, State Violence in Canada from Slavery to the Present, and Rehearsals for Living with Leanne Betasumaki Simpson. And she too is a member of the No Pride in Policing Coalition. Uh, we had a fourth guest um, who was supposed to be with us this evening, um, Monica Townsend, but due to um, debt in her community, she was unable to be here today. We send our love and care out to Monica at this time. Um, Brie, um, we would like you to start. Thank you and welcome. We'll try it with the unmute. <laughs> Anin, Rini Dishgad, Jaganash Bun knows when, Brianna Olson, Biduan Quentin Dishnakaz, Minwa, Nishnabum Win knows when, Wasaze, Nimda Nangus Quay and Dishnakaz, 
Mimam P, Toronto and Dona, Minwa, a Miskachiwa Skehegan, and Dunjaba, Minwa, a Wikwam Kung Singh unseated First Nation in Dota Bindakwas, Atakus and Dodem, Nishinabi Kwe and Dao, Nimigwat Chwendam, Kinawea, Nimigwat Chwendam, Shikak Mukwe, Nimigwat Chwendam, Gishigad. So, hello everyone. I will translate uh, what I shared in my Nishinaabemwin language. I am uh, Brianna Olson Pitawanaquit. Uh, that's my name in uh, partially in English. I am also um, a Pitawanaquit, which is our Nishinaabek name from our community, uh, meaning between the clouds. I'm also uh, in my Nishinaabemwin language, uh, Shining Dancing Star Woman. I am. Uh, currently living in Toronto, uh, but have also called a place called Amiskwachi Waskehegan home. Uh, it's a Cree word for Beaver Hills House, otherwise known as Edmonton, Alberta, in Treaty 6. And uh, also I'm from a place called Wakwemakong Unceded First Nation, which is on Manitoulin Island. Uh, we are an unceded nation, meaning that our um, we have never signed uh, a treaty with the Crown and uh, however we are currently uh, some of the uh, party holders in the uh, Robinson Huron Treaty case uh, on the North Shore of Lake Huron and I'm very uh, proud to be from a, a strong uh, and deeply rooted community. Uh, we call all of this territory, our traditional territory, our Nishabic nation is one of the largest in uh, what we call Turtle Island and uh, it spans uh, through many provinces and many states and uh, yeah, we, as we say in our Nishinaabek teachings, we have as many homes as there were seasons, so we lived all around the Great Lakes region. Uh, I am Indigiqueer, I'm Anishinaabe Kwe, and uh, I'm very proud to be part of um, many of the uh, talks, the um, gatherings, the, you know, teach-ins and uh, actions that take place uh, during Pride Month, but also Indigenous History Month, uh, which is an important time uh, for our people, but I, you know, I often say that it, it translates all throughout the year and that it's important for uh, people to understand the lived reality uh, of Indigenous people today on these territories of our homelands, but also, uh, you know, um, the history. So with that, I will uh, share a bit about, um, you know, my interpretation of a um, abolitionist future uh, of what you know that means as Anishinaabe Kwe on my territory and uh, I'm coming here today to speak um, as someone who is uh, in this moment acutely uh, suffering with um, an autoimmune disorder um, I was just diagnosed uh, actually yesterday and uh, this is in conjunction with like other autoimmune disorders and the reason that I bring this up is because um, it's it's not a surprise within our own communities, uh, Indigenous communities, uh, we are vastly overrepresented with autoimmune disorders. Uh, every single um, family member of mine who had attended residential school or Indian day school later in life was diagnosed with autoimmune disorders and that includes many of our the descendants of those family members and you know we find that um, overrepresentation in so many different areas within society you know we're at the top of you know overrepresentation for pretty much every single you know tragic issue that you can find uh, in this country right now and that is a direct result of colonization um, a direct impact of ongoing colonization as well, uh, namely uh, two things that we uh, deal with and, and support and um, address here on a daily basis in Toronto is um, the results of the overdose crisis as well as houselessness, poverty, um, and again, you know, just uh, health issues that have um, and continue to be, you know, aggravated and impacted by colonization. 
within our community, we um, stand alongside and this and uh, with the grassroots people. And this translates all across Turtle Island. Uh, we align ourselves with people that um, are of the land, are of our traditional teachings of the laws and ways that we have lived as Anishinaabek and various nations uh, for tens of thousands of years. And when we talk about, you know, abolition, we're thinking about, you know, abolishing um, these systems of, you know, carceral punishment, uh, the systems of, you know, colonial white supremacy and um, realizing that there is very much systems that have existed and continue to exist here since um, time immemorial. Within our Anishinaabek nation, we call that uh, Chinook and uh, And Christy Belcourt very much um, like elaborated that in such a beautiful way when she said, uh, the earth is my government. And knowing that those laws uh, translate, you know, uh, above and beyond um, these English uh, British common law, which is the current system that has um, supplanted itself here and very much continuously violently displaces our traditional ways. I think what I'll, I'll touch on today is about how, you know, oftentimes we'll find our uh, grassroots people um, facing some of the harshest criticism within our communities. Uh, when in fact, grassroots, uh, indigenous, queer, two-spirit, trans, non-binary, intersex, indigenous people are uh, very rarely <laughs> aligning themselves with governments, uh, NGOs, political parties, uh, and practicing that Chinook and Agawin, that traditional law or that um, natural law, and doing so, uh, you know, oftentimes underfunded, um, you know, um, and doing work that is highly politicized. Uh, and uh, one thing that I'll touch on as well is the, um, you know, some stories in relation to kind of what's going on now here in Toronto. Um, one of the major reasons uh, that we have been very critical and hypercritical of what's happening right now around Pride is the alignment with uh, police and uh, the city of Toronto, uh, both of whom are, um, you know, continuously uh, sentencing people here in the city to uh, unlivable conditions, uh, you know, um, impoverished conditions where people are uh, finding themselves houseless. Uh, and many of those people are uh, folks that are struggling with, you know, intersections of disability, um, substance use, uh, you know, uh, racialization, uh, Black and Indigenous people very much overrepresented in those areas. And um, it's just so interesting because within our own culture, we we have a, a real, like, uh, kind of guidepost as to, like, what houselessness is and what it means uh, in relation to our community. So my late cousin, uh, he recently had just... Um, passed away at a, at a very young age, but he would tell stories about, you know, our uncles and, and uh, when they would talk about coming to Toronto in the 70s and, uh, and about how everybody just slept in parks in the 70s. Like they would just come to Toronto and go sleep in a park. Like you didn't need accommodations, you didn't need a hotel. It's our traditional territory, just pull up and go sleep in a park. And my uncle would say, you know, they had the audacity to, to call us homeless uh, and that we weren't, uh, we weren't houseless, uh, that this is our homelands. And you often hear older Indigenous people referring to people uh, living outside as uh, campers and, and not saying like, you know, uh, that, they're, that they're homeless, that they're actually just campers, that they're camp living, living outside. Uh, very recently I came across like a, a tr you know, there's kind of the, the recipe for disaster that we see within the city time and time again of where, uh, you know, the city pits, the campers or people living outside uh, against the people in the community. And, you know, we, we see that NIMBY, um, uh, you know, nature come about, uh, you know, not my backyard. 
And there's a petition going around right now in regards to our own neighborhood here. We live um, adjacent to the village um, and Cabbage Town in a park that has, you know, uh, become another site of where people just have ended up uh, for many very tangible reasons. Uh, one of them being the lack of affordable housing in Toronto uh, and you know, the, the NIMBYs said, how dare they live in these parks rent free? <laughs> and uh, as if the plight of their, your, your neighbor wasn't the reality of it being so absolutely impossible to live in Toronto right now because of the cost of living, but the fact that people weren't paying rent, you know, um, and the reality of this as uh, indigenous organizers, and we see this very often in our own communities, is that indigenous organizers ourselves are, are finding ourselves uh, in precarious conditions. Uh, the very first year of TIER, uh, the founders, including myself, uh, were houseless for several months due to um, a hate crime that we experienced. You know, and that any, you know, anyone really uh, can be, you know, can find themselves in those conditions and uh you know this capitalist ideology that um you know how dare they how dare people live outside and not pay rent uh rather than how dare the city continue to create these conditions that are so completely impossible to survive in and this is something that has again been the very root of this territory uh unto itself uh, there was the land acknowledgement in the beginning and, you know, recognizing that that treaty, Toronto itself was, uh, was, um, I guess, founded based on the Toronto Purchase, uh, which in itself was theft of Indigenous land and um, the, uh, you know, manipulation and, uh, and, and lies that went into that, um, that shady deal. Uh, where they were able to purchase the whole of Toronto for eleven dollars, eleven shillings. Um, so you know, recognizing that everybody, including the NIMBYs, are living here in Toronto uh, based on theft of Indigenous land, and again, the ongoing um, displacement. And what you'll find right now is that you know the vast, a vast majority of the people that are living outside um, are Indigenous or racialized, uh, and that has very much been again, you know, compounded by like the, um, the uh, immigration uh, laws that they've, you know, are, um, are just continuously, um, you know, just hurting people with and uh, the idea that this is their land and uh, that white settler uh, notion you know, NIMBYs, and we have to look at, you know, the idea that NIMBYs have also created the philosophy, um, have uh, created this philosophy that actually gave rise to the RCMP uh, to regulate Indigenous people under the guise of civility. You know, how dare they live outside? How dare they live next to our uh, forts? How dare they, you know, um, how dare they live? And uh, that uh, it was very much rooted in uh, property and uh, the violence uh, of protecting one's property. And you see that notion come up again and again with city parks. Uh, you know, this is the same system that gave rise to charity, our charitable the idea of charity. Um, white women appeased uh, their guilt rooted uh, in underlying um, notions of white supremacy um, without addressing the actual social conditions uh, that um, created those, you know, unlivable conditions for uh, people and people being Indigenous people at the time. So, you know, we have to recognize the, the histories of the systems that we take as normal today that we consider, um, you know, cornerstones of our community and our society and, you know, breathing life into uh, the grassroots, into the radical organizers in our communities. and. You know, and I said yesterday, I said, you know, two years ago, it was one park. The next year was another park. Uh, this year, it's another park. And I said, you know, five years from now, in a city with this, these unlivable conditions on stolen land, it's going to be every park. And those are the, you know, conditions that we are living in right now. As Indigenous people, 
uh, we see counselors like Chris Moyes, uh, I'll say his name explicitly, is trying now to pit the indigenous people who are, you know, occupying uh, green spaces or parks here in the city against the houseless community uh, or in, against people that are living outside. And, you know, it's not going to work because we recognize the, the deeply rooted um, factors uh, that have led to, uh, you know, the fact that their houselessness even exists on our traditional territories, not just for our communities, but for everyone. So I want to leave with people. It's something that I said at the speech uh, that I did at um, the um, uh, flag raising um, event where we did the uh, No Pride in Policing uh, action. It was that you know we at any point in time can come back to those traditional laws that Indigenous people hold on these territories that have existed here for tens of thousands of years. This is not a lawless land. This is not a place without um you know values and um beliefs uh it is a place that is so strong with those things and that our communities hold those knowledges so deeply in our being uh and that we are raised with these um and if not if we weren't raised we are coming back to them um because many people were displaced uh through the 60s scoop and residential schools you know and uh there's songs about it uh round and songs about as long as the sun shines, as long as the grass grows, as long, you know, as the rivers flow, uh, these are, uh, you know, the treaties, the, the beliefs, the values, these natural laws will exist. And we will exist as Indigenous people here. And people can look to these nations for knowledge, for strength, look to the grassroots for those, you know, ideals that we, we can begin to uphold, rather than this British common law that we, um, we do want to abolish when we say when I say abolition, I mean British common law, I believe I, you know, I mean white supremacy, I mean capitalism. Uh, so, you know, sol solidarity um, and, you know, looking to uh, indigenous liberation as, you know, our uh, a future that that I, I want uh, a future that I want for my son, a future that I want for my future children and um, yeah, with that, I believe I've gone over 12 minutes. I'm super grateful to be here. Um, miigwech everyone. And uh, now how I will pass it on to the next speaker. Miigwech. Thank you very much, uh, Brie. Jamie? Thank you very much. I'm so honored to be on this panel. Um, I'd love to I'd like to send my love and uh, solidarity to Monica Forrester because um, she's somebody that I really look up to uh, for the uh, amazing work that she does in the community. Um, but um, all of the people that are on the panel today are, are likewise heroes of mine. And um, uh, like I say, very honored to, to participate. Um, so, um, I'd like to begin by talking about um, the summer of 2021 as a reaction to um, a lot of grassroots work that took place in the summer of 2020. During the summer of 2021, the city of Toronto unleashed a storm of violence on encampment dwellers and supporters in a series of botched encampment clearances. Armed police with riot gear, drones, cavalry, pepper spray, private security guards descended on the encampments, which included Trinity Bellwoods, Lamport Stadium, and Alexandra Park. Two cops were photographed wearing thin blue line patches, a white supremacist patch to signify the importance of uh, protecting the nation from quote unquote chaos meaning the queer and trans, black and, ind and indigenous and racialized damned. The city spent nearly $2 million on these clearances. Those who were arrested and detained were released on the condition that they were not to join fur further public gatherings and or enter public parks. The Toronto Police Services carried out a program of terror and harassment by publishing posters of people declaring them wanted and requesting the public's assistance and identification. 
The tactic was intended to terrorize activists and deter anyone from challenging the sudden intensification of police state violence in Canada. Encampment clearances were orchestrated from coast to coast, from Vancouver to Halifax, with similar terrifying violence and conditional releases after arrests. The targets of violence were primarily queer and trans, Black and Indigenous and racialized people. Militarized policing and surveillance massively escalated in intensity in the summer of 2021 in reaction to a summer of rebellions in 2020. The international uprisings against anti-Black policing in response to George Floyd's horrifying murder at the hands of the police needed a state answer. The answer was revealed um, in the form of an intensifying uh, the global city as a site of imperial struggle. In Toronto 2020, thousands took to the streets in a series of protests condemning the police for their role in Regis Korchinski Paquette's death. The protests called for justice for Regis and in solidarity with actions happening worldwide, not another black life. They were live streamed and supported from coast to coast. The escalation was also a response to First Nations land defense as exemplified by Chief's assertion of sovereignty and rejection of coastal gas link in 2020. Also in 2020, the 1492 Land Back Lane Collective was gaining popular traction, as was the Afro-Indigenous rising occupation of Nathan Phillips Square for the entire summer. As the impact of the COVID pandemic intensified, several public park encampments, including queer and trans, mutual aid, and First Nations groups set up public pedagogy events on food sovereignty, access to decarceralized and alternative health care, grassroots and indigenous harm reduction, and collectivized life. Following Sadia Hartman, I'll refer to these criminalized collectives as wayward communities. Wayward communities emerge from the oppressive living conditions under militarized policing. From police state violence emerge communities such as those created by encampment dwellers, sex worker collectives, migrant farm workers, substance users, massage parlor workers, undocumented refugees in neighborhoods such as Escarcia in Athens, favela dwellers in Brazil, land back camps and migrant caravans to name a few. These are collectives such as is depicted in Our Dance of Revolution, a film documenting Toronto's black queer community. Likewise, I'm talking about the self-organized, um, sorry, uh, self-organized co collectives, communities, and autonomous zones, communities that have been subjected to criminalization, surveillance, and militarized clearances. With Sadia Hartman, I argue that contrary to criminal and pathological, these communities are sites of liberation praxis, an innovative life genre. The dialectic at work and being centered involves death logics in the service of financialized racial capitalism against the struggle for collectivized life, characterized, as Ronaldo Walcott would say, um, by a certain kind of sovereignty over self in relation to collective and communal conditions. The communities emergent from these dialectics are sites of communal praxis that reclaim social life from gentrified spaces offering up pedagogies to live differently. For example, through grassroots street-based harm reduction, I've seen evidence of this kind of collective caring and sex worker organized spaces. Against the destruction of public housing to make way for securitized gentrification, sex workers have created spaces for communal meals and collectivized access to gently used clothes, low barrier STD testing, vaccinations, peer harm reduction counseling, access to life-saving supplies, childcare, culturally appropriate healing, and collective safety. Wayward communities kicked into high gear innovating collective community defense responses to the state's death politics around COVID. These community-based innovations represent sources of collectivized dual power, 
undermining the capitalist state. Dual power is a revolutionary process whereby the people's self-determination process emerges and exists alongside of the state. Coalitions of wayward communities, what Leanne Sipson might call constellations of co-resistances, create revolutionary dual power through solidarities formed as a take back the city strategy among those exteriorized from and criminalized by the capitalist nation state. The heart of this revolutionary process is that people demonized by the state turn to each other in community to innovate life-affirming care praxis. Paradoxically, this wayward revolutionary process is made stronger rather than weaker by virtue of being rendered as disposable and therefore not deserving of state services such as housing, food, life-saving harm reduction, and like dual power autonomous zones, such as the Chiapas, honoring life through collective self- Amy, we lost your audio. Can't hear you. How are we doing now? Uh, I can hear. Yeah. Me too. Free here, I can hear. Yeah. I'm also hearing as well. Yeah, I can hear her fine. So it might just be you. Uh, Rajan? Rajan, how should I continue? Um, I'll message Chris on this side and, and work out the audio. Okay, okay should, I, should I carry on? Yes, because uh, the ASL is hearing you and I'm hearing you and that's critical. Okay, <laughs> I'm, almost, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, thank you, Rajan. Thank you all. Thank okay. you, everybody. So uh, like autonomous zones like the Chiapas, Henri in life through so collective self-determination is chosen over state violence. So for example, in 2020, Maggie's, an organization by and for sex workers in Toronto, doubled up on their harm reduction and street outreach. Butterfly, an organization for Asian and undocumented sex workers, began offering legal clinics and services for massage parlor workers. Monica Forrester established Trans Pride Toronto, a hub of harm reduction and collective life in Toronto's downtown East. Brilliantly, Maggie's also set up a series of low barrier COVID vaccination sites in strip clubs in the downtown East, um, a grassroots collective initiative that allowed those without health cards or citizenship to receive vaccination. Toronto Indigenous Harm Reduction, um, and we heard Brianna tonight, uh, an entirely queer and two-spirit uh, collective became established through the work of Brianna olson Pitawanaquat and Nanook Gordon and volunteers. And as frontline services were, were rapidly shutting down amidst COVID-19 pandemic, um, the Toronto Indigenous Harm Reduction began offering basic needs and uh, critical uh, health support, uh, COVID-19 testing, harm reduction, and uh, many other things, uh, traditional food, expressive arts, and ceremony, and food justice networks that had already been established grew stronger in response to massive insecurity brought about by the pandemic. For example, the Black Creek Food Justice Network became much more vibrant and continues developing strong coalition politics with migrant food workers and the Jane and Finch Community Action Committee and other groups. Food justice to this network entails understanding the connections to capitalism, policing, and criminalization of race and poverty. In short, grassroots networks dedicated to food justice, harm reduction, street and encampment health access and mutual aid have cultivated politically sharp abolitionist politics, challenging colonial racial capitalist policing and providing alternative visions of collective life. In 2020, we witnessed the growing traction of grassroots networks, coalitions and dual power capacity, solidarity building within Toronto and in solidarity with movements nationally and internationally calling for defunding and abolishing the police and all policing institutions. At the same time, global cities have emerged as a critical and intertwined overlayer to what I will call, or what is called, new imperialism. 
New imperialism is built on histories of colonialism, and it's characterized by racialized, hierarchized arrangements of imperial and subordinate states. The goal is not to conquer nations for new territory, but rather keep subordinate nations in line and vulnerable to ongoing economic exploitation. Imperial states accumulate wealth by using the threat of white supremacist military might to shamelessly exploit and subordinate nation states. The financialization of new imperialism is coordinated by international finance institutions such as the IMF, the WTO, the World Bank, whose economic policies are enforced via militarized policing. So global cities such as Toronto are networked hubs enabling financial flows and are therefore assets that must be securitized. FinTech or financialized technologies, including algorithmic innovations are designed to securitize and extract from everything, a low grade debt, a block of buildings, a municipal debt, health management, and therefore entire life systems, social services. And Assassin explains, these are securitized and brought into financial circuits where, where they can be bought and sold over and over. So financialized tech, tech innovation, also is, it, it also compromises the complex algorithmic technologies of surveillance and evidence-based policing, predictive policing, and so on for waging a domestic urban warfare against poor, Black, Indigenous, racialized queer and trans communities. At the same time, global racial capitalism has produced global cities as destinations for surplus populations, migrating because of forced dislocations resulting from capitalist-induced disasters, political crises, money crises, ecological crises, genocides, and petrol wars. In addition to concentrations of infrastructure critical to finance capital, the emergence of Toronto as a global city involved a few decades of neoliberal restructuring and austerity policies in the context of forced migrations to manifest fully as a segregated and hierarchized urban geography, a plantation city, which is also a securitization strategy. As a global city, Toronto has therefore become a site of domestic urban warfare against wayward communities. Global cities then have become concentrated sites not only of high-end smart infrastructure for imperial finance, but likewise concentrated sites of imperial and counter-imperial struggle. The counter-imperial urban struggle is organized around access to a livable life, relation to care, of care, and self-determination. These pedagogies of collectivized life emerging from abolitionist communities are sources of hope and inspiration for creating a better world. These pedagogies constitute uh, what Robin and Leanne might call rehearsals in living, or as Andrea Ritchie and Marion Kava might say, abolition unfolds one community at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jamie. Thank you very much. Um, Robin? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Beverly, for the introductions. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Um, I also want to send big love and support to Monica Forrester. Um, and I'm also just really glad to be sharing the space with um, Brianna. Jamie and Beverly, organizers who I have shared many panels with, but also shared many meetings with, organized demonstrations with, and we still get along and respect one another, which is not necessary in all movements, but it's very, very helpful. And it's really, really just nice to be here sharing this uh, space with you in this um, political education in the lead up to abolitionist pride. So I was thinking today about some of the radical histories of pride, some of the many radical histories of pride that stand to inform the conditions that we're facing today, that stand to inform the work that lies ahead. Anyone who knows me knows that I love to look backward to help look forward. So that's something that I'll maybe just do for, you know, some of the opening remarks that I'm going to open up with today. I just wanted to say 
before beginning that beyond my bio, um, I am also a gay black woman a history, uh, with a history of involvement in many, many movements from networks of families working to end police killings to black liberation work to migrant justice and sex worker justice movements. Um, and I wanted to wish all of you a happy pride. I tried to decorate today with this sign that I think you can see part of that says my pride is black because we are here in a particular month um, that is both a history of struggle, but also one of revolutionary love and celebration as well. So I've worn many hats over time, uh, organizer, movement journalist, uh, harm reduction worker, parent of an energetic child, and more recently um, as a professor where I get to bring together knowledge from many of the hats that I've worn. So right now I'm teaching a course on, it's called Abolition Feminisms, and shout out to any of my students if you made it here. But um, for the first week of Pride Month, we were looking at the history of incarcerated Black radicals in the Black power movement and looking at some of the queer, Black, and feminist histories of incarcerated radicalisms that help us understand histories of prison abolition differently, histories of abolition differently, um, because I think that Sometimes we have this idea that it's only, you know, more recently, and of course, Beverly Bain's work uh, and history and life organizing shows against, you know, shows the opposite of this, right? But this idea that queer, Black feminisms are something that's entirely new to this moment and not something that's actually been a long part of our struggle. So I was trying to have us all think uh, in class the other day about the history of, um, of pride and where pride comes from, right? Which I think that many of us know um, that it's not abstract and it's not just um, a metaphor to say that pride began as a riot, that pride began as organized, as, as a riot against um, policing of queer and trans black communities, racialized communities in particular. And I think that there's a way that, that is really important to center and anchor the, as we come into a month that can often be really depoliticized right now. And what I was also asking with my students to do was to look back to the history of just actually next to Stonewall, 500 feet from Stonewall, uh, that you can learn about from reading Hugh Ryan's Women's House of Detention, but looking at how inside um, of the Women's House of Detention, which is, you know, only 50, 500 feet from Stonewall, there was also a riot in support of what was happening outside the inside of um, this prison where Afeni Shakur and Joan Bird, two queer Black women who were part of the um, Black Panther, uh, the Black Panthers who'd been incarcerated on trumped up charges, uh, who were openly, at least in their own communities, um, queer women who were part of uh, and supportive of the gay liberation struggle, and in fact, also looking at how so many of the protests that continued, you know, in um, in and around the Stonewall riots were actually gay liberation organizers in support of the Panther 21 of Afeni Shakur and Joan Bird and against prisons, right? So I think that the reason I'm bringing back this story um, and the reason that I think this is important for us to remember is that gay and queer liberation movements, black liberation movements, um, have not been perfectly connected over time, but have been really important, though we know that there's been racism in the mainstream gay liberation movement. We know that there's been homophobia within some iterations of Black power movements. If we look together, we can see that there have been many historical moments, in fact, moments of immense and powerful uh, global um, and transnational organizing histories in which our struggles were already together, right? So I think this is something that's that's, that's really helpful for us to ground ourselves in as we come into these, these present moments, this looking back to look forward. And I had us do this little speculative exercise, which is to ask, what would Pride have looked like this year? What would Pride in Toronto, for example, look like this year if the kinds of real movement cross-pollinations that we saw in the heyday, the early days of gay liberation and Black liberation and red power and anti-prison organizing, um, had not been sidelined and sort of pushed into separate uh, margins, but it actually remained at the center from which our movement had maintained their focus. Now we know that many of the people involved in those movements, many of the queer Black folks, especially, of course, were trying to do so, but we're saying, so what would happen if the entire movement had actually um, kept, kept these ideas central? What would things look like today? And what we ended up coming up with, what people came up with was this very beautiful vision where ideas around prison abolition, the ab imagining worlds without uh, reliance on police and policing were already widely understood and demanded by huge swaths of the LGBTQ community. Um, that there would be, that there could be a pride that had no corporations and no banks present, 
that of course there would never have been police at Pride, that that never would have been a question. Um, the theme that they came up with for this year was uh, solidarity and community care. Um, and of course, I, I think something that's beautiful about that is that these are many of the themes that are, of course, part of No Pride in Policing's abolitionist pride, right? But imagining a, 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 a different vision in which um, LGBTQ, Black liberation and anti-prison movements had remained so anchored such that we could imagine a pride where all of these, you know, a large pride that millions of people came to that brought together all of these ideas where Marsha P. Johnson, Monica Forrester, and others were um, more central to the ways that we understand the history of our movements. So this is a speculative exercise, but I think it's one that's really helpful in grounding ourselves in these other possibilities of what might have been. And, you know, there are, there are reasons why this did not come to be. And one of those reasons is, you know, domestic warfare against black radical movements across North America that left many of our elders to languish for decades in prison and, you know, locked up the next generation of people in the prime of their lives so that this could not happen again. Um, we also saw the ways that particularly white, um, white cis and middle class um, gay communities abandoned some many of the more radical elements of the communities they had originally been, been supporting, right? So we know that there's been ways where a lot of what we had been fighting for in different moments was pushed back to the side. But knowing these histories and knowing how they intersected is generative because it takes away from the arrogance of the present, um, where we say we're finally connecting all the issues now, right? There's this arrogance where we can say a, present, a presentist arrogance um, if we look to different historical periods where we did and have connected long before, right? And it also grounds us in understanding that there's a lived history of thinking about LGBTQ history that is Black liberation struggle, that is anti-police struggle, that is anti-prison struggle, that is trans liberation struggle, and is anti-capitalist, that is uh, in support of the environment movement, and that the times when our movements have been the strongest, when we were closer than we've been in decades to transforming not just North American societies, but the world, we understood our struggles to be linked and we acted as such. So the history of pride and some alternative histories of pride as a riot against police, as a queer prison, prison riot in a prison holding primarily black women and trans men and gender non-conforming people shows us differently and shows us another timeline that we can hold tight to. We know the dangers of what happened when we don't remember, right? So we can see some of the more mainstream reaction to when um, BLMTO or uh, you know, protested at Pride to get the police out of Pride, which again is something that is such an incredibly successful and powerful event, but we know that it was critiqued by some parts of gay community saying that it was not a gay issue, right? As if these histories have not consistently, as if queer Black people had not been consistently on the front lines of, of many struggles, right? So it remains formative to, to look at the links that we have, that we inherit, that we inherit from people who have struggled before before we do, as we as we continue to move uh, to move forward in trying to reestablish some of the interconnections that we know that we were going to need if we're going to face the times ahead. So, I think that just taking stock of the current moment, it's really important to remember that the way that the ideals of the mass black queer led racial justice movement of 2020 have been so betrayed so quickly. Um, even though so many people uh, in our society have been transformed, really, I believe, um, by the idea that we could really create societies, um, not only without policing, but that actually focus both financially and politically on building real community safety, right? But we still continue to see policing being forwarded as the problem, as the solution to every economic, social, and racial inequality that's structured into our city, um, into our country, including you know, the, the rising violence against LGBTQ people that of course we're seeing around the world, somehow increasing police budgets at Pride is seen as a solution for this, right? This shows us just the kind of magical thinking that has to happen to make policing be the response to anything, knowing that police have never helped indigenous communities as groups like No More Silence um, have made very abundant and clear, never supported racialized LGBTQ people as Monica Forrester's work in particular has made abundantly clear, even in the context of serial killers, in the history of the Pussy Palace raids, right? So it still somehow becomes, still somehow becomes a solution, which goes to show the lack of political imagina imagination and a real betrayal by those um, at the helm of, um, of leadership positions. Um, we can see that the rise in violent incidents on the TTC, even though we know that 
um, people who are poor, people without housing, who are most impacted by viol are most impacted by violence, including police violence. Um, policing is still somehow being brought into the solution as this, as, as is actually cutting TTC service, right? People have nowhere to live in public parks, living in encampments. Again, police is the solution. Indigenous communities defending their own land, whether that's 1492 land back lane or elsewhere. And again, policing is the solution in the context of an ongoing defunding of mental health supports, community shelters, um, some of the only people getting pay increases that are decent. And again, of course, to the police, right? So it shows us what happens when nearly any community that we can think of who's experiencing marginalization, who's experiencing really being pushed out systematic, systemically by our society through anti-Black racism, through ongoing logics of genocide, all of this um, really um, policing becomes the way to manage every issue. So I think that Jamie and Brianna have spoken so beautifully about alternative visions for safety. And many of us work together, for example, on the Another Toronto is Possible uh, coalition uh, um, campaign, really trying to work to bring this city uh, towards a budget that could defund the police by 50% and really vastly redistribute resources towards uh, community supports, public transit, housing, um, more broadly, right? That these are many kinds of rehearsals for the world that we want to live in. And I know Beverly you'd wanted us to speak just a little bit to what is happening in the present or what needs to happen in the present. And I do think that we are not in the kind of revolutionary moment that we experienced in 2020 when there were thousands in the street every day. But I think that in what I try to think of sometime as the in-between times, this is a really important moment to to be making these kinds of connections, to be talking across movements, to be doing political education such as this, to be trying to heal old conflicts, to maybe start campaigns with people who you may not even agree with, um, making connections between the different kinds of attacks that we're seeing from the right, whether that's on trans people, against the environment, um, against people without housing, that get us ready for the next moment when um, of, ma of mass mobilization, right? So this is that kind of boring, unromantic time of that kind of connective tissue work. And I do think that we don't see it in the media because it's not sexy and it might not be out in the street with thousands of people, but it's really important and valuable work. And I think that for people who are feeling despondent, getting involved in the, the grunt work of boring in-between time movement work is something that's really important that anyone can take up um, and, and really ought to in a time like this. So let's see. I mean, the last thing that I think I would want to close with, I don't want to go over my time, is just to, to reinforce that we're we're going to need to figure out how to defend our communities against ongoing attacks from the right, um, working to build more livable futures in a time when we're also seeing, you know, mass forest fires like we've never seen in floods. So I think that it's a really important time to try to stay, um, I guess, motivated, even in a time of lack of motivation, because it, this is a time that's probably going to ask more from us than, than we could have realized. So I was always thinking with the words of George Jackson, and these words, you know, they were said um, from prison shortly before he was assassinated, but they're still so, so resonant today, even though now it's been almost 40 years since his death, but he said, so, uh, settle, your, settle your quarrels, come together, understand the reality of our situation, understand that fascism is already here, that people are already dying who could be saved, that generations more will live poor half butchered lives if you fail to act. So I think in one way, these words are trying to bring to light the severity of the situation, right? The fact that we know that there are countless of people being harmed and suffering unnecessarily, but it's also, I think, bringing up another world that is dangling before us, um, thinking about the words, people who are dying, who could be saved. It's not only a loss, right? But it's a call to action and a reminder to the, that the many, many, many people who could be saved by collective action it's a call to not forget the world that is still possible and the many worlds that are still possible. So in a time that we live in, which is one of enormous responsibility, we're inheriting many of the struggles. And I spoke to some of those, you know, the legacies left by Afeni Shakur, another queer um, Black woman who were political prisoners, but so many other um, people who've been part of the struggles in the years that came before ours that we are inheriting uh, to take up or ignore as, as, we move into, as we move into the years ahead. So the only one thing I would want to really leave us with is a reminder that there's nothing that's natural or permanent about the way that things are. And that, you know, our communities today are organizing on the front lines of so many um, forms of harm that are less than 500 years old. 
right? Whether you look to the prison as it exists today, the kinds of policing as they exist today, the kind of imperial ecocide that has transformed, you know, the built environment. Uh, that these that none of these things are immutable. That definitely, that absolutely, history shows us that none of these things are permanent. They're very contemporary, in fact. So whether it's the struggle against Cop City in Atlanta, where there's a plan to cut down historic forests to put a police training center where Georgia State Patrol recently killed uh, gender nonconforming Chob Tugrita, an environmental activist who was, you know, with their hands up. But these people are on the um, organizing a week of action that's coming up, these incredible campaigns, right? The struggle to abolish uh, CERG, the RCMP's Community Industry Response Group. Um, there are community, there our communities are really everywhere, including many of the people today on this panel um, on the front lines of so many kinds of organized violence because we believe we believe that these are not permanent. We believe that we have the capacity, whether it's in our lifetime or another one, to, to, to try to actually build the world that we're that we need to live in um, in this present moment. So as we're, you know, as we're here together in Toronto on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Nishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, we're steeped, we're steeped in so many histories and presents that tell us that there are other ways of organizing land under original stewards that proceed and inform the present and our future of what is possible. We all come from different political histories that show us that there are many other ways that we have tried and will continue trying to build new, more livable worlds. So what we really have to do is, is come together and to hold tight as we as we try to step into what whatever the next steps ahead may be. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you to all our speakers. We got a full, comprehensive, rich uh, uh, sense of what abolitionist futures are, um, should be, what it is, um, what are the, the, you know, the conditions we are dealing with. I mean, Brianna opened up speaking particularly to her present situation in terms of her autoimmune disorders, which of course is very much connected to colonialism is connected to the ongoing destruction of our environment, of our everyday. It's connected to the ongoing, uh, you know, homelessness, poverty that's impacted by colonialization uh, that indigenous people live through. But also spoke very clearly to the fact that grassroots organizing is where it's at. That it is with grassroots organizing that we are uh, able to counter this attack, considering it's coming from masses of people who see people living in the parks as, as invaders of those parks. We see the city uh, uh, clamping down through securitization and surveillance, right? And as, um, you know, Brianna tells us, you know, that the parks and the land are indigenous land, yet these lands are, uh, are capitalized, they are securitized, and what is required is abolition, the abolishment of white supremacy and capitalism and colonialism. And Jamie take, took us through um, speaking to global cities and the way it's financialized, uh, but more importantly, the kinds of wayward activism that we are seeing, not just um, here, not just locally, but globally. And she spoke to other places where she saw that uh, those kinds of actions against fascism, against um, um, uh, um, uh, securitization, against financialization that have been that are taking place internationally and globally, and the kinds of work that grassroots um, uh, uh, activists in this city continue to do as a way to uh, um, uh, defend each other, but also to um, um, uh, preempt some of the vociferous violence that continues to impact our lives, right? Uh, you know, the waging of war, you know, um, uh, on our cities and our, our, and our indigenous and on indigenous black racialized uh, poor people and those who are the most disenfranchised, right? And using that, you know, uh, you know through financial technology and it, the way that's being uh, innovated, and the conversation um, that, you know, um, you know, that also that um, uh, Brianna leaves us thinking, 
you know, and when we look at what's happening with pride and pride's alignment with police that continues to sentence people to impoverished conditions in this city, yet we see that, you know, an organization like Pride Toronto is, um, you know, um, is participating in the acceptance of $1.5 million that the province has actually thrown at um, queer organizations in this city as part of Pride Month. Uh, and also at the same time, we know that it means an escalation of policing and security throughout all of our cities. Robin takes us um, uh, through, you know, uh, the protest of Stonewall happening in particular historical moments when there were other struggles happening alongside it, that of black power, that of red power, right? And also, you know, um, liberation, um, queer liberation, all happening simultaneously. And this has been a history. And I think what I heard Robin also kind of referring to is the fact, you know, and, and I think Gary Kinsman speaks about this in his work on sexual regulation, is this whole social organization of forgetting. That we forget that there were moments in our history when we organized, when we organized alongside each other, uh, we, along, we, we organized, we benefited from each other, but particularly a lot of the uh, political kinds of organizing that queer uh, activists benefited from, they benefited from the organizing of black power, they benefited from the organizing of red power, and we benefited from different cross organizing. And that um, so often we forget that we do have this. And this is why I think we already have those resources, which is why we see that we're able to put that to use in these present times to combat the kinds of, you know, the, the, the wars that have, um, that are constantly, that we're experiencing at the hands of the state and of policing, right? Um, I wanna actually, and I, I really, I mean, this has been really amazing um, um, uh, presentations from our panelists. And I want to actually, because this is Pride Month, I wanna actually um, throw out a question dealing with pride in terms of what it means, in terms of the kinds of struggle that we are attempting to, you know, to create, um, the kinds of, uh, you know, um, thinking that abolition is supposed to do, the kinds of imagination for building a livable world. What does that mean when we have um, organizations like Pride, as Robin mentions, you know, which lacks imagination and which doesn't actually seem to recognize the impact that it's having when it is so depoliticized as it is in this moment, but not so only depoliticized. In fact, in the kinds of strategies that it employs, it is also impacting in deadly ways the lives of indigenous, black, racialized people in this city. I want to hear people talk more about what it is that we need to do. And I mean, Robin, you gave some examples of pride needing to rethink how it's working, the ways in which it needs to reimagine, you know, its, 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 its labor and, and the way that it's organizing and to think about its organizing. I personally do not want to fix pride. I would like to see pride dismantled because I think pride is no longer serving its purpose or representing the people, it's, it, you know, queers and trans and uh, uh, um, uh, queer and two-spirited uh, uh, people in this city. And I'd like to hear from people how we should be organizing, you know, as queer and trans people in this society, in this city, you know, particularly in this moment where there is so much violence from the state and more violence to come, from the deployment of policing and security. Um, would uh, Brianna want to go first? Or Robin or Jamie? Or should I just pick you or? Uh, yeah, I can go. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, you know, for our community, uh, a lot of people like, Pride is not a central focus for so right. many uh, indigenous, queer, trans, you know, um, gay, uh, indigenous people. 
uh, specifically because so many of our relatives are still living on reserve. Uh, they're living in remote communities. They're living in uh, situations where uh, they may be displaced from their community and are living in, you know, situations where they feel unsafe as a queer uh, person. And that in those spaces that there, there really isn't, you know, and I, and I often feel that pride is something that's so disconnected from like the lived realities of our people on a daily basis and the mm -hmm. struggles that we face as grassroots people and people that are, you know, uh, potentially on the front lines on a regular basis or uh, organizing in the background that the idea of, you know, um, it, it feels, yeah, it just feels really out of touch. And the fact that, you know, once a year it'll come around and we get to revel in, you know, uh, whatever, you know, this highly funded, um, you know, events that happen. It, uh, and the, the rest of the year that there's just like, nothing um it feels like such a vacuum that is filled by everything else that everyone is actually doing day to day around survival and you know when we're talking about the lived realities for indigenous queer people for indigenous trans people for you know um our people that are potentially here or out of the city like it 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 doesn't factor in and you know, um, I'll speak for like for myself is that um, I think there's maybe two years that I participated in any pride. One was in Albuquerque and one was here in Toronto. And I never participated, participated in pride again because I was treated very poorly. Um, I was treated, uh, you know, I was uh, demeaned. I faced racism from other um, you know, people within that community itself that just didn't have an anti-racist, um, you know, praxis. They didn't understand the history of pride. They didn't understand the history of Indigenous people and our presence here. And that felt um, that, that, you know, veered me away from that, um, that organization very quickly. We saw again, like the continuous um you know uh, misappropriation of money and and you know for some people and it's really sad because it's like you know for some people they do feel like this month is maybe the one thing that represents them um but how do you reconcile as an indigenous person when literally like millions of dollars like we're not talking about like a very like a small $10,000 grant, we're talking about millions of dollars that was misappropriated, that there was, you know, dishonesty, that there was false reporting, that there was continuous patterns of behavior of theft and misappropriation. And, you know, it feels like the very, like, such a, a deep rooted problem of anti indigenous racism, that it's like, how do you reconcile that? So I think for our community, it's like, how do we find places of like radical organizing as queer people or as trans people or as two spirit people, the rep, the other 11 months of the year when we're literally out there just trying to get by and trying to, to fight and trying to, you know, I think really, again, like the lack of, um, you know, nuance around, um, you know, looking at how like ethno, you know, white Christian nationalism is like a, such a factor in what's happening right now on um, the attacks on our communities and how deeply, you know, personal that is for indigenous communities because of residential schools and that, you know, I think the conversations are only starting there and that we really have to um, have space for that deeper understanding of what uh, this country participated in, not just pride, but like all of Canada. Um, so that's kind of where, where I'm at. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, we're just, you know, we're proud. We're proud all the time. <laughs> like 
like literally all my neighbors, I live in a, a queer co-op. I'm like, all my neighbors are queer. I have, you know, indigenous neighbors that are queer. It's just like a beautiful place. And I'm, and I wish that for anyone in our community so that we can create those livable conditions where you can be proud and look to a community all the time. It doesn't have to be represented in a party or a parade by run, you know, funded by banks that again, like banks that are actively funding, you know, paramilitary attacks on indigenous people across the country. So anyway, I could go on, but I'll pass it on. Miigwech. Thank you. This is why no pride in policing coalition exists. <laughs> um, uh, Jamie or Robin? Sure. Um, I have a few thoughts on this, um, but okay. I'm going to bring it back to what you actually uh, said right there at the end, Beverly. So then I, I want to toss it back to you, actually. But I mean, I think that I have really complex feelings about it as somebody who when I I lived in Montreal for a lot of my adult life and I would come to block Rama, you know, I would make the, the pilgrimage to block Rama to be around more queer black people than I had ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and would come back every year and it's been over a decade so and I look about at some of the work that that you've done Beverly that Omi Sheree Dryden have done to really look at you know the really powerful queer black histories that went into that you know some of the really beautiful queer black formations that are absolutely not identical to or like reducible to pride but are you know part of this you know part of this kind of large gathering of of queer folks you know the struggle to take up space within uh, communities that have historically considered us to not be a part of them, right? So I think that there's something that's really important there that I do think that regardless of how, what formation that looks like, I think that in a in a future that I could dream up that was more liberatory, it would not be bound to corporate mm -hmm. pride, right? But I want to just elevate that there are these some parts of what's happening that I think are really valuable, especially in this moment of this mass right-wing push against LGBTQ I people and trans people, especially to literally push some of our communities out of existence. I think that I'm still of the position that holding whatever ground we have um, in, in the Kosovo onslaught that we're on, whatever that may look like is something that I try to keep in mind. But what I'm also trying to think about is more, not less, and say, how do we as queer folks more broadly outside of that, that particular organization come together to create a transformational political force, right? As we're coming against what we're up against, that's capable of holding the stakes and the interconnections of black liberation, um, of indigenous sovereignty, um, mm -hmm. at the intersections of queerness. How are we able to recreate again, movements that are able to actually create a strength here? So I think that we have this moment, which is very terrifying for many, but it's also a really important moment, I think, of political education. That's why I'm really happy to see these, this series actually happening this year in particular, because there are masses of people who had become, who are maybe not particularly politicized, right? Um, being, it was possible, there, there, was a, there was a brief window in which being gay seemed as if, you know, you could be a right-holding citizen being, you know, but we're seeing that you know masses of people who are realizing that the rights they may have assumed they would have may be taken away and that's always a really important moment for, for education, for inviting people in to learn about the histories that the rights they may have taken for granted have also been taken away or never given to other communities. It's a pos it gives us a moment of possibility to intervene and educate and help people again, uh, you know, to, to use this moment, you know, as Maryam Kaba and Kelly Hayes' new book says, to let it radicalize them, right? So how do we use this moment of right-wing radicalization against our communities to re-radicalize our own communities to remember these the, the histories uh, that we come from that have been organizing not only against um, police and policing, but also against vigilante uh, homophobia, transphobia, right? So I think that these are some of the these are some of the bigger questions that I'm starting to ask um, my own my own self in terms of what's it going to mean for us to defend our communities given um, given what we're up against and what this might mean for people who didn't realize that. <laughs> who didn't realize that they might find themselves on the wrong side of the police when they may have supported policing in the past, right? So I think that's something that gives us, a, as much as it's terrifying, also gives us uh, something and provides some learning moments and provides some, some kind of moments for possible uh, transformation. But what I wanted to say, Beverly, your answer to that was NPCC abolitionist pride. And I think that's it, right? One of the answers is to create alternative exactly. political exactly. formations right exactly. so I to, exactly you know that you're not on the you're not on the agenda but I think that if you wanted to take this moment to talk about you know why we're here what is abolitionist pride like uh, I think it's something that's that really is the an alternative a living alternative that we're all part of right now so I just wanted and to I, and I'll come back to that at the end but I just wanted to say one thing 
about us taking space in pride. And, I'm, and here you're talking about Blockerama, right? And in the form, um, you know, that's organized by Blackness yet. That would have existed with or without pride because that was formed long before it was what it was today. And it was formed by Black queers, black, the Black uh, Women's Collective, Aya, the men from Aya. And it was extremely political when it was formed, right? It was an, a political event that also, uh, you know, engaged cultural participation and cultural pieces. And I guess the question becomes is when you become part of a larger uh, contingent that is so overwhelmed by corporatization and by capitalism, you lose that space that you once created. It becomes enveloped in ways in order for it to exist. You know, um, in its, you know, in terms of its central politicization, that gets lost in something much larger. So that's that would be my response to that piece. But certainly, you know, in terms of, you know, um, um, you know, what we, you know, in terms of um uh, you know, blockorama and blackness, yes, that would have existed with or without pride. And in fact, pride actually depended on us as we grew bigger and bigger in terms of not, not only bringing black people together, but bringing racialized people together, right? And that, so I think, I think what, the, what always happened is that black people's lives get usurped. And there was moments when we were disappeared during that pride and when certain aspects of our lives were actually being played out in those spaces without our bodies in those spaces. So um, we see how, you know, uh, and, and the politics then gets eroded in that process, which is why, you know, abolitionist pride uh, that is organized by No Pride in Policing Coalition is so critical because what it is meant to do is to, um, you know, um, to remind us of the politicization of you know, the queer movement, of the way that pride has always been political. It has always been about our freedom, our liberation. It has also always been about building relations, which is what this, what NPPC is. And I'm just, and I'm going to go to Jamie because, uh, because I want to ask this last question of all three of you, um, which I think is really, for me, as we're having discussion, is really critical. And everything that you have said in terms of how we need to think about building is how then, how then do we, you know, um, how then do we uh, uh, build relations? You know, uh, um, Robin, in, your, um, in yours and Leanne Betsumasaki Simpson's um, Rehearsals for Living, you said something to Leanne and I want us to kind of um, speak to that. You said, Leanne, how are we going to live, right? Um, there is no going back. And you said that in the chapter on home space. How are we going to live, right? And I asked that question because what No Pride in Policing Coalition is also about is about thinking about how we live, right? How we create. I mean, it's what abolitionism is. It's what abolition is. It's not only what we take apart but how do we build? And you all spoke about the different kinds of uh, mutual aid and the different kinds of projects that, have, that, that, that activists have taken up. But how do we live in relations with each other as indigenous, black, uh, Afro-indigenous, um, you know, uh, racialized people, white people in this, on these lands? Because I think that's something we have to talk about. And I'd like, um, I'll start with Jamie since you haven't, you know, you haven't spoken uh, with that, and I'll ask um, Brianna and Robin to please speak to that. Oh uh, well, thank you, and um, I'd like to start by saying that I would like to see Pride Toronto, which I call corporate Pride, dismantled uh, for all of the reasons that um, you know have been uh, articulated here and other teachings. Um, and, you know, um, I think when you have such a huge corporate entity as corporate pride uh, mm -hmm. and 
you're trying to create something that is kind of like a globalized space in terms of global pride, you know, you're really building into all of these politics of um, globalization that I was critiquing as mm -hmm. becoming uh, a hyper securitized um, uh, er entity. And so I go back to uh, what Re was talking about in terms of uh, the importance of, of, of feeding um, the uh, the kinds of futures that we want to uh, create, uh, the kinds of uh, re rehearsals for living that we want to to have from 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 grassroots collectives. Um, corporate pride is basically a magnet for a lot of funds um, coming from the federal government, coming from uh, the, the the city, and. You know, as, as uh, Tom Hooper has um, uh, brilliantly, you know, uh, exposed, those funds have been misappropriated. Um, they've involved taking um, money to create Indigenous art and asking Indigenous artists to, you know, give up the, you know, creative property rights. Um, there've been, there's been, you know, a tr tremendous amount of corruption and, and so on. Um, you know, grass grassroots collectives can have their their own um, pride spaces, and um, you know, abolition pride is is you know is a beautiful way to to begin that um, that that process. Um, but you know, um, I do remember um, doing sex worker justice uh, work where. A lot of the sex workers uh, and the harm reduction that we were in, involved with and, uh, included uh, uh, trans sex workers uh, who did not feel comfortable in a pride that was, uh, you know, um, where, where police were included. And so, you know, um, it, I think it's more than uh, the case that, that, you know, we're talking about queers uh, versus the police. We're really talking about um, you know, as Robin was saying, how different struggles are integrated. And we're talking about liberation for everybody. And liberation for everybody can't happen unless if we have, uh, you know, the dismantling of, of the police state. And corporate pride is in complete collusion with that police state. Um, so um, I, I do think, um, uh, you know, the, the space that has been created by abolition pride is a, is, is a beautiful space. Um, and I'd like to see, you know, more of that. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Um, I'll go to um, uh, Brianna and then to, to um, Robin. Brianna, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question too, and I'm going to be even more direct. I'm also asking this question, um, particularly as Indigenous Black and Black people and racialized people on this land. And you know, how do we live so that we can create worlds that are livable, that respect the land, that respect the environment, that, ex that, ex that respect the water, that respect each other, that also acknowledge our histories and how we build relations together. Sorry, I can't, I can't You're hear you. Sorry, your mic. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. The traditional values that we hold in our communities around uh, queerness and uh, Nij Manadawak, the two-spirit uh, ways, um, are so, like, inherent mm -hmm. that even, like, the enunciation of them is something that is, like, new for our communities. When you talk to elders in our communities, even my own mother, it's just a given. It's just like a natural, normal way that we lived is embracing the infinite diversity, including gender diversity that existed as a reflection of the natural world because the natural world is inherently queer. It is infinitely, you know, different and varied and uh and so 
right now I feel that we're in a time and you know and I and I felt like this since I was a young queer growing up on the prairies is that it really is life or death and you know I, I think sometimes when we come at things from a, a space of uh, you know our own inherent privilege I am very privileged now as, as compared to when I lived in that space but I'm still an Indigenous woman. The moment I walk out my door, I'm 17 mm -hmm. times more likely to be murdered in Canada mm -hmm. than a white woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. that doesn't change. I, I literally can wear any type of clothes. I can do whatever, have the safest lifestyle, and that still doesn't change. And I feel like that is very much the case right now for our communities with the attacks on trans people, with the attacks on people that I love within my own community, with trans people who I call family. Mm -hmm. My partner is trans, the father of our child is trans. Like we are in a time of life or death. And I think that we very much, again, like I, I appreciated what someone said about how there was almost like a, a an illusion that we are like in an equitable world and everything's mm -hmm. great. We're all gonna get our rights. and at the you know drop of a hat it just changes and we are now completely under attack and i think that that very much aligns with the reality that us as indigenous people have faced here since 1492 that we have to work on our solidarity because our lives depend on it and and it's very easy if we are in spaces mm -hmm. where we are separate from that that threat to not see that reality but that is the reality right now for our communities and that you know these relationships can be i'll just share a teaching this is what i'm going to finish with so i have a word in our language called wewene it means like to walk softly in this world and i see that as how we build our relationships I don't see that in how we defend ourselves. I don't see that in how we have to navigate our rights in this world and our responsibilities, but I see that in how we foster and sow those seeds of solidarity in our community is that we walk gently amongst ourselves and that we do things with care and intention. And that's what we need right now uh, more than ever. And that the future right now is not livable for so many of our people um, under this, you know, paramilitary assaults, under the harm that police continue to inflict on our people mm -hmm. um, through racialized violence uh, and through the alignment and the uh, like actual, um, you know, allowing that they are, you know, creating for white, you know, um, supremacists like white nationalism to just literally flourish. It is like, the police are complicit. They're actually participating in it. Um, so this is, you know, again, I go back to the organizing that I started on the prairies. It is life and death and that we have to remember that. Um, and that when we build these relationships, we can do so in a caring manner. When we care for our people in our community that need our support, that their lives depend on it, we can move with that care and intention. But everywhere else, we got to fight. And that's how I see things right now. So. Thank you, Bree. Robin? Thanks so much, uh, Bree, for sharing. Um, yeah, you've really given us a lot to sit with there. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, I think I'll keep this part small because I know we're coming to a close soon, but this question about how we're going to live is something that is one of the undercurrents of the book that, uh, of letters that I wrote with Leanne, but it's also a, such a huge question when you are a parent Right? when you're teaching a child how to live in the world, how to be decent in the world. And I just think it's interesting how many of the things that we teach them um, are so much more applicable to the society that we live in. And uh -huh. what we teach children is often, uh, unless we're really clear with them about the, world, about the world that they live in, what we're teaching them is not really applicable to the world, right? Because we teach them, don't harm people. If you see other people being harmed, intervene. Don't, exactly. abandon, don't abandon and don't harm. Right? These are two of the things that are most important to how you teach a child to grow up to be an ethical human being. If you don't explain to your to your kids, though, you know, my son's seven, people say you need to wait till your kids are a certain age. That can't be true, right? Because you need to explain. We live in a society that's not organized that way. The idea of don't abandon and don't harm 
that's two of the fundamental structures of how Toronto works, right? We leave people who don't have access to housing, to transport, to getting around um, literally abandoned by state structures, people being turned away from shelters every day. And then those same people are harmed. You know, you have to show uh, your children what's happening. Why is that person being moved out of the park who is just, you know, who is just hanging out there in a sleeping bag, right? So we say, we can say, we believe in the principles, don't abandon, don't harm. We have to fight for those, right? These are things that we have to fight for because we live in a society that doesn't do that. And I talk about that with my son all the time, but I think that much as you don't want to oversimplify the broader political world, I actually think that those those basic principles are really what it means to think about what abolition is, to think about what kind of more ethical ways of living um, of, of living in the place that we do, right? And some of it is more complicated. So this gets into, you know, we're gardening. The land that we're on, this is stolen. We are stolen, right? You can't mm-hmm. own land and you can't own people, but we live in a world where very powerful people have believed that mm-hmm. and still do believe that, right? That these histories mean something to us. Mm-hmm. So again, trying to undo that, what does it mean to be in a place where the land is stolen? Whose land is it? Is the mm-hmm. next question. And what is our responsibility? then right Mm -hmm. as people who have been stolen as well whose lands have been stolen elsewhere um, Mm -hmm. by by the same people right so again this brings back to a kind of shared responsibility a shared ethical you know commitment to the future and a kind of just taking seriously what it you know taking seriously what it means to be a good person is all about what parenting is but it's also about how to navigate actually in this world one of the final things that I think I both am consistently reminding my son that I also would (laughs) remind you know, I think is some of the basic center of my work is that people died, our ancestors died because they wanted us to be free. We might not be free in the way that they had envisioned, but we owe them something, right? And we owe future generations something as well. And I think that, again, just thinking about responsibility is something that is really what it means to think about what liberation might be, to think about what we owe one another, what we can collectively do, how do we interrupt the various kind of harms that we know are part of our society works and how do we build mm-hmm. a place that abandons nobody, right? So I think instead of getting into the nitty gritty, I think there are so many really important movements that are geared towards exactly this issue, right? Whether it's people working in support of those living in encampments, whether it's the incredible work that Brianna is mm-hmm. doing and Monica Forrester that's every single day committing to this principle, don't abandon, right? What does it mean to take care of our communities? How do we push back the forces that are trying to harm us, right? So I think that- right. For anybody who wants to take this seriously into their own life, right, there are so many, um, and Jamie, you did such a great job of illustrating this as well, the grassroots organizations that are on the very forefront of don't don't abandon, don't harm, they're all across our city, if you're tuning in from, you know, from yeah. for those of you who are listening, there's no way that there's not, in whatever city you're living in, an organization of people who are working, you know, with a political vision to support um, and end to a ho- the housing crisis in your city that are trying to organize uh, against the policing budget. This is These movements are everywhere. There's small little parts of them everywhere, whether it's working to get police out of schools, mm-hmm. um, universities divested from fossil fuels, right? There are so many different um, parts that it's the opposite of overwhelming, right? There's actually so many ways to plug in that it's just a matter of finding one way and, and sticking with it because, um, you know, Ruthia Gilmore, Term this really well when she says that all we can do as individuals is tweak Armageddon, right? But collectively, we have the capacity to, to do so much more. So it's that, I think, just thinking about collectivity and and again, holding tight, which is what I was trying to, to really close with before, is, is, is what we need to be doing at this time. Yeah. Thank you for that, Robin. Thank you very much. Um, before we end, I'm going to ask each of you to give us to leave us with one last uh, brief uh, um, statement um, on, you know, um, uh, what, um, you know, anything that you would like to say uh, in terms of leaving people with a message around abolition, around abolitionist futures, around how we build, how we should be building. Um, and, 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 you know, we heard a lot, but one sort of sentence that you would like to leave people with in terms of how we move forward. Jamie, do you want to start? I think what I have heard tonight from everybody and what I'd like to underscore is that 
um, the movements that are working at the level of grassroots are collective. And uh, those collective spaces teach us about how to move, how to navigate, how to keep ourselves well, how to care for one another. When we um, have entities such as corporate pride, that encourages privatized uh, spa spaces and encourages uh, relationships with police, uh, which uh, guard private um, property and 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 you know securitizes um, individuals. Um, I would like to uh, plant my hope in how wonderful it is to participate in collective life and the belief that we will choose. Once people can experience what that collective life can be, we will choose that over violence. Thank you, Jamie. Robin? Thanks so much, Jamie. I think the, you know, really just the last thing I would say, there's so much, um, and those are beautiful words, Jamie, but I think I would just, you know, close on a reminder with this as a panel on abolition, right? That just reminding us all, and I know that everybody here knows this so much, but abolition is not an academic discipline or set of theories that, or not, it's, it's much, much more than that. It's a practice, right? It's a praxis, it's a way of life, it's a way of doing and asking questions and continuing to build uh, and build and build and build, right? So it's, I just wanna remind us that, um, even people who don't call themselves abolitionists are building transformative futures um, outside of police and policing all the time, building futures that are about um, life and taking care of uh, whether that's planetary life and earthly life, whether that's human life, whether that's you know the children in our communities, whether that's the people who've been most deprived of having access to a life, right? So this is um this is the kind of doing and it's doing together. And I think that's at the root of it. And it can look like many things from four people in a collective to a very large, you know, cross-national day of actions um, to, you know, a group of teachers or high school kids working, you know, organizing to change the conditions of their school to make them less carceral. So it can look like many things and there's not one way. Um, and that's actually the beauty of it. Thank you very much, Robin. And I will read Brianna's um, piece. Uh, she had to leave to take care of her, her baby. Uh, the sentence is that we will return to our natural laws. We practice every day as indigenous nations, that people become acquainted with them and the lands and histories and indigenous thought and values that are alive and strong today. Thank you to uh, Robin Maynard, Brianna Olson, Peter Wanaquat, and Jamie Magnuson for your brilliance today. It was just amazing. And I want to uh, invite people who have been following us to continue to follow uh, our remaining teachings on Thursday. Our next teaching will be on harm reduction at 5.30. And I urge you to, um, to please tune in and also our final teaching is on uh, the 21st on um, uh, uh, poetry and art at the end of the world. So please stay with us um, and come back. And uh, uh, our, our teachings will be online on YouTube. It can be viewed at a later time. Please view them. Please, um, um, you know, um, uh, attend our Pride uh, March on the 25th, um, uh, the No Pride in Policing March on the 25th of June, which starts at one and we it's followed by a picnic at three o'clock. Um, so please, please stay with us. Thank you to our interpreters, Chris and Alex. And again, thank you for being with us this evening. And thank you to our amazing panelists. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you.